And thank you for joining us for the first debate between the three announced candidates for Secretary of State. With Secretary of State Gene Atkins leaving at the end of the term, we have an open seat. For our debate today, we will have a two-minute opener with the candidates going in a randomly selected order. Then we will have four to six pre-selected questions with each candidate given 90 seconds to respond, rotating by which candidate who responds first. The debate will end with a two-minute closing statement. Thanks to our timekeeper and Portland Public School teacher, Laura Fisher, who will be seated at the front to make sure to make sure we are staying within our time limits, and I would ask the audience to please hold their applause till the end of the debate. Laura, will you hold up the time card that will be seen there? That's the 30 second one, that's the 15 second one, and then there's the uh, ominous red one. <laughs> All right, so with that said, uh, the first opening statement will be made by Senator Richard Devlin. Senator. My name is Richard Devlin. For those of you whose memory stretches back that far, many Oregon Democrats first knew me as the guy who showed Bob Tiernan the exit door to the legislature. For those of you that do not remember, Bob Tiernan was perhaps the most notorious anti-public employee, anti-union legislator that we've had in this state. Of course, I'm also known as one of the most exciting speakers and charismatic <laughs> figures on the political landscape. <laughs> Everyone will tell you, nobody, nobody can whip up a crowd like Richard Devlin. <laughs> okay, well, maybe not so much. But I am proud of, I'm proud of how the hard work, and, I, I am proud to have worked hard and successfully to make Oregon government work for people and the communities at every level. Before entering the Oregon House, I served in the Marines on the Tualatin City Council and on the Metro Council. Since then, I have served as both the Democratic leader of the Oregon Senate and in the last five years as the co-chair of the Joint Ways and Means Committee. In that role, I have been intimately involved with every part of state government. Why is that important? Because one of the Secretary of State's most important jobs is being Oregon's Auditor-in-Chief ensuring that government is efficient, effective, and financially responsible. To do that job well requires experience in how government works, and I'm the only candidate that has the experience at the local, regional, and state level. Details matter in this job, and I am proud to be known as the person in the legislature that gets the details right. Experience isn't the only criteria, however. I believe the Secretary of State's work should be also informed by the values we hold dear as Oregon Democrats. I have spent my career not just espousing those values, but delivering on them in good times and bad. For our schools, for critical services for seniors and the disabled, for the protection of the most vulnerable Oregonians, particularly abused and neglected children. That is the kind of person who can make the Secretary of State's office work for Oregon. Thank you. And why I would be honored to be, have your support. Thank you, Senator Rich, Richard Devlin. Next uh, uh, opening statement will be given by Representative Val Hoyle. Thank you. I want to thank the Democratic Party of Oregon, and I want to thank everyone that's here today for giving us this opportunity. And I'm really excited to talk to you about why I'm running to be Oregon's next Secretary of State. When I turned 18, I remember I went to school, and my girlfriend turned to me and said, you're 18, you know what that means? And I immediately said, yes. I can go vote in the next election. And she looked at me funny and said, well, I was going to say you could go to Rhode Island and buy beer, but I guess you could vote. <laughs> but I knew from a very young age that my voice mattered in the political process, whether it was walking on picket lines with my father, who was a union president, or going to feminist rallies with my mother, which is why when we came here in 1999 and found out about the disinvestment in education because of Measure 5, I stood up and got to work. I joined the PTO, I worked on bond measures, I became chairperson of the Democratic Party of Lane County and elected pro-education Democrats. I was appointed to the House and I had the great honor after one term to be selected by my colleagues as House Majority Leader. And in that time, we led the nation in passing progressive legislation. We did things like tuition equity. 
background checks on private gun sales, and in the face of massive opposition by big oil, we passed clean fuels. But what I'm most proud of is that we put ballots in the hands of over 300,000 eligible voters in Oregon. But that's not enough. As your Secretary of State, I would like to continue in the legacy of Governor Brown and Secretary Atkins to reduce barriers to voting. I would like to use the audit function to make sure that we have transparency and accountability in state government. And I would like to continue to be a champion for small business and working people. As your next Secretary of State, I will stand up for you. I will do what I've always done. It's fight and stand up for each and every one of us. And I would be grateful if you would stand with me in this campaign. Thank you. Uh, please, please hold your applause. Thank you. <laughs> um, the next opening statement will be given by Labor Commissioner Brad Avakian. Thank you, Democrats, for hosting this first Secretary of State's debate. My daughter Claire and I recently visited the church that I was baptized in. It was built by my immigrant grandfather and his sons. He was a carpenter who fled oppression and genocide to find a better life in America. And I learned early on the progressive values like earning a fair wage and contributing to your community, what those mean to families that are just getting started. It's one of the reasons that I believe every Oregonian has the right to a great education and job. And that's why I helped restore 21st century shop classes to over 100,000 students and have trained thousands of workers for good living wage jobs. I also believe that you shouldn't have to worry about your employer stealing your paycheck. And that's why I've returned more than $22 million to the pockets of workers who have been treated unfairly at work. And because I believe it's unacceptable for a woman to earn 79% what a man does, I created the Oregon Council on Civil Rights to build the pathway to equal pay. My entire career, I have used every tool at my disposal to make sure that discrimination is swiftly and aggressively prosecuted. And because of the urgency of climate change, I have fought to build a clean energy future, including passing Oregon's Renewable Energy Act, the most significant climate legislation in a generation. I'm running for Secretary of State to build on these priorities and put our progressive values into action. I'll use the State Land Board to promote clean energy jobs. Corporate accountability will continue to be a hallmark of my work as I use the audit corporations uh, uh, to audit, or to use the audit division to audit corporations that contract with the state to ensure that they're following equal pay, minimum wage, and safe workplace laws. And when it comes to elections, let's build on Oregon's success for greater democratic engagement, starting with the return of civics education to our schools. Thank Those you. Those are my values. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, we have the first question, which will go to Representative Val Hoyle. Yeah. What can you do as Secretary of State to reduce the influence of dark money on Oregon's candidate campaigns and ballot initiatives? Thank you, that's a fantastic question. And I wanna say very, very clearly that corporations are not people and money is not speech. But until we overturn Citizens United at the national level, it is really, really difficult to, to tackle the campaign finance situ situation. Now, one of the things that we can do is make things more transparent, and that is what I have worked to do in the legislature, what I would like to do as Secretary of State. The problem with campaign finance is when you shut off, you put limits here, it's like a balloon. You squeeze it on one side and it comes out the other. In states with very tight campaign finance limits, you see dark money and independent expenditures. So what we need to do is do things like the bills that I worked on, HGM 2 and 4, to have a constitutional convention to overturn Citizens United. Because if the federal government won't act, then we as the states need to tell them that that's what needs to happen. Our Supreme Court made the wrong decision. I hope that we can elect federal elected officials that will return power to where it should be, to the people. But until then, I will work towards transparency and will work to see what we can do to ensure that Oregonians know where the money is coming from in all of our campaigns. Labor Commissioner Brad Avakian. We have got to do everything that we can do to get big money out of, out of politics. I support public financing of campaigns. 
I also support strict campaign contribution limits. Citizens United is wrong. Legal scholars know it's wrong. People know it's wrong. Corporations are not people, and the day is going to come when Citizens United is overturned. I want our state to take the lead in passing campaign finance limitations, and if it gets appealed to the Court of Appeals, the Oregon Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court, fine. Let it happen, and let's keep passing those laws until the Supreme Court overturns this wrongly decided decision. Senator Richard Devlin. Like my two prior speakers, I be believe the Citizen United decision was a decision that actually threatens our democracy, particularly at the federal level. However, I have to be very blunt with constituents that ask me about that. Because the reality is in Oregon, we've had Citizens United ever since the or interpretations of our Constitution, which actually allows us to put no limitations on contributions or expenditures. And I have actually, in numerous sessions, introduced legislation uh, to amend the Constitution, the Oregon Constitution, to be able to do that, and did support then Secretary of State Brown's efforts to do that during the last session. Now, until we have those, it is a very imperative that we improve our reporting system. Our reporting system, I will tell you, is one of the best in the nation. However, given as long as I have been in these positions and as a Democratic leader and a candidate many times, our system has become more lax. There are realities within that system that even though you are reporting uh, items, there are missing items. Anybody who is familiar with how campaigns operate, who knows what expenditures should be reported, can look at CNE reports and can look at and determine that there are some things that are not being reported. Also, it is very difficult to follow the transfer of funds between numerous different political action committees and numerous different candidates, and that is not transparency for the Oregon public. All right, the second question will go first to Labor Commissioner Brad Avakian. Motor voter will register over 300,000 new voters in our state. What can you do to make sure they vote, and what do you think the impact will be on major and minor parties? Uh, this is about equality and about access to the ballot. I think motor voter uh, is going to be incredibly important for having people that are part uh, of minor parties have that kind of act, kind of that kind of access, and I, you know, and motor voter is going to get folks registered. We took a huge step forward and led the nation in doing that. What I want to turn to now is greater civic engagement. Uh, that starts with the turn, return of civics education to our middle schools and our high schools, raising generations of folks that we already know are paying close attention to what happens in the world, but building the pathways for them into public service and into civic engagement. And in doing that, Motor Voter then becomes implemented in a way that has a real effect on people's lives and gets them engaged at an early age in the democratic process. Oregon took the first step. Now it's time to take it to the next level, and that starts with the return of those civics education classes. Senator Richard Devlin. We all know, and perhaps it would be best not for me to bring this up, but we had tragic circumstances in the early portion of this year. And Secretary of State Brown became governor in a very short period of time. What we all don't comment on is Secretary of Atkins became Secretary of State in a very short period of time. She and her staff have been a very, a very good job of implementing Motor Voter. It is not as simple as it sounds. For those of you who do not know the details, they will be actually, as people come into motor, motor vehicles for the next five months, they will actually be registered if they are not registered. Those people that were prior to January will actually become part of the voter rolls after the primary election. But I'm going to speak a little bit. I seldom speak in a partisan sense here. It's going to be up to the people here in this room and other people in this, in this state to ensure that those people actually get out and vote, uh, to ensure that maybe we can convince many of them to join the Democratic Party, and to let them know that their voice counts, and let them know whatever their background, their voice counts. Uh, we heard a lot of discussion here about sometimes the party 
uh, talks to certain groups during the election time and other groups, and then not during election time, they do not. We need to talk to everybody. We need the biggest tent we can have in November. Thank you. The next question will go first to Senator. Wait, what about me? Oh, I knew I was going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Just the boys get to answer? Is that true, really? Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> The <clears throat> Representative Val Hoyle. Thank you. Look, I know that not every 18, 18 year old wakes up and says, great, I can vote. I know we have too many disenfranchised voters. And while I was a representative, I, I, I worked with um, my local social studies classes, went to every single high school, engaged uh, high school st students in the civic process. I worked with our local NAACP AXO program to identify leaders and work with and mentor young people in communities of color with CAUSA, with the NAACP, to make sure that it's not enough that we invite people to our table and say, I called, I invited him to the meeting. We actually have to grow our table and make a table that's representative of all voices. And that's something that as the chairperson of the Democratic Party of Lane County, I did not see because I walked into that room and didn't see people that look like the people in my district. So I think we need to do more, whether it's providing ballots and campaign uh, um, candidate information in multiple languages or reaching out and inviting people to the table, but not to be just a token person there, but actually to grow the table, to change the agenda, and to actually move forward in a more creative way. Um, I, I believe that our state is like a mosaic. It's not like a melting pot. We each bring something so valuable to the fabric of this state, and we need to do more to encourage those people who don't feel like they have a voice to have that voice be heard. Thank you. And now, for the third question, Going first to Senator Richard Devlin. The Secretary of State serves on the Oregon State Land Board. What are your priorities for using your voice on this board? The Oregon Land Board, which has existed for quite a long time, has the responsibility, it's made up of the Governor, the Secretary of State, and the Treasurer, uh, for overseeing state lands, both those that we own in rangelands and forests, and actually, uh, actually the land that uh, is under our rivers and some of our lakes and in other areas. I look at this as does Commissioner Avakian, but a little bit differently, uh, as a way to demonstrate what we need to do from an environmental standpoint. Um, I also think that there is things that we could do there that would be a greater demonstration. I do know also that there is a controversial issue out there about the future of the Elliott Forest. I will tell you that I would urge you right now that if you have a position on that to lobby the Secretary of State, uh, the Treasurer, and the Governor. Because if you know the process that people have gone through, the intention right now is that they will make that decision on the future of the Elliott Forest <coughs> before any of us potentially take office. They've been working on this for a number of years. And it's a much more complex issue than I can explain in this forum but I think there are valid points on both sides of the issue about the future of the Elliott Forest. Thank you. Representative Val Hoyle. Thank you. Um, when Oregon became a state, we had over three million acres of state lands in, our, in the Department of State Lands, and now we have um, just around 750,000 acres. And we were given those lands to be good stewards and in the Constitution, it says that we need to manage these lands for the highest and best use for the common school fund. And on the state lands, I believe that we need to do as much as possible to ensure that we protect endangered species, that we protect old growth, and that we manage our forests so that they are healthy. But at the end of the day, I think it is incredibly short-sighted to sell off pieces of our state lands I think we need to do a better job in terms of being good stewards, managing those lands, and working, um, working with people from all around the state to make sure that we pr preserve this great treasure that was given us. Labor Commissioner Brad Avaki. Well, this is an issue that's very personal to me, and I know it is to many of you. Uh, and it is to me because I authored Oregon's 
uh, uh, Renewable Energy Act in 2007. The State Land Board has jurisdiction over all of the Oregon coast, all of our state forests and lands, and every navigable river. This is the place for us to launch our effort on climate change. We have got such an opportunity in Oregon with geothermal energy along the central and southern part of the state, a perfect shelf off the coast in order to establish wave technologies, and all over the state, terrific places for solar and wind power. And I think that Oregon should be the leader not only in creating a healthy environment by fighting climate change, but in taking advantage of the clean energy economy that is springing up all over the globe and in other states. The State Land Board is the perfect place to advance a climate change agenda, and that's exactly what I'm going to do with it. Thank you. The next question will go first to Representative Al Hoyle. The Secretary of State's office is responsible for auditing state agencies to make sure our tax dollars are spent wisely. If you are elected Secretary of State, what would be your priorities in this role? Well, as, as a working mother, I understand what it means to count every penny. And I know that Oregonians expect that their state dollars are used um, well and as efficiently as possible, protecting and providing critical services. Um, and again, making sure that we manage so that there isn't waste. Um, with the audit division, you have financial and performance audits. And I think um, it's important that we see where we are hitting our targets. That's important but also where we must do better. I mean, I think that, that we've seen um, most recently uh, work that needed to be done in our foster care system. In terms of a priority, what I would do is use the audit function to ensure that our children are kept safe and that every dollar that we're spending on our children is, is we are ensuring that those children are getting the best value of that dollar. Um, these agencies, these state agencies, do work and do incredible work that touches real people and makes a real difference in people's lives. And we need to ensure that as a legislature, we make the laws that, and we set targets, that those targets are being reached and those tools are available, to, again, to help every single Oregonian. Thank you. Labor Commissioner Brad Avakian. Historically, the Audits Division has done a terrific job of tracking the tax dollar through the agencies uh, and making sure that they've got their policies and procedures in place to use, uh, to use the money uh, effectively. Um, all of us bring something different to, to this race and to the position. What I bring to it is after 15 years as a civil rights lawyer and seven years as your labor commissioner, I'm the one that knows how to hold agencies and to hold corporations accountable. Now, what, I, what an audits division under my uh, 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 leadership will do is to start auditing private corporations that are on contract with the state of Oregon, and there are millions of dollars going there to not only make sure that the dollars are being used for their intended purpose, but to make sure that those private <coughs> corporations are following our minimum wage laws, our equal pay laws, that they have safe workplaces. Private corporations that contract with the state of Oregon should not be making a profit at the taxpayer's expense unless they are treating their employees fairly and using the tax dollars for their intended purpose. Thank you. Senator Richard Devlin. I don't want the audience here to believe what they already believe about me. But I have read every audit from the last two years. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and I have spent many years, it took me probably six months to even to learn how to say this, as the co-chair of the Joint Legislative Audits and Information Technology Management Committee. <laughs> and for the first time, I, got, I was able this time in this session to get the actual committee that it's supposed to be, the Joint Legislative Audits Committee. But the difficulty I see in the audits process, and many of the things that have been talked about here, some of them can be done, some of them are a little bit more difficult, is the typical pattern for audits is an audit is done, problems are found, an agency responds. Sometimes the problems are addressed, sometimes they're not. The audit goes on the shelf and the Secretary of State comes back in a year or two and does another audit. I think it's incumbent as the state's <laughs> chief auditor to, if I find a problem, 
I'm not going to leave the problem. If the agency doesn't correct the problem, we will be back in the agency in a very short period of time, and we will stay on the problem until the problem is resolved. Thank you. The next question will go first to Labor Commissioner Brad Avakian. With Oregon's population skewing towards urban areas, some think that rural areas in our state are becoming less and less relevant to our statewide elections. How do we improve, improve rural involvement in our political process? You know, as a statewide elected official, I have spent the last seven years visiting every four corners of our state. I, uh, just, just, uh, just a few weeks ago, Debbie and I were in Enterprise and Wallawa and Joseph visiting those communities. And I, I have to tell you, the numbers may show that there are more voters in the metropolitan area. Uh, but you've heard me say, and I believe it deeply, that the metro area needs the rest of the state and the rest of the state needs the metro area. We are a team of Oregonians here. Uh, our elections in Oregon are oftentimes at the statewide level, especially with ballot measures, decided by the very smallest of amounts. <coughs> Equal access to the ballot, participation in the process is just as important for an individual in LaGrande as it is for an individual in Portland, Oregon. And you can, you can know that as your Secretary of State, I will continue a strong presence in every single part of Oregon. The other thing I, I, I want to mention is this notion of bringing the civics education back to the middle schools and high schools. That is not a Portland issue. It's not a Eugene issue. That is an issue for every single young Oregonian that's growing up in our state and deserves not only to have the information that comes from those classes, but deserves to have uh, every chance and ability to, to participate in our process like every other young person in the state of Oregon. Thank you. Senator Richard Devlin. Any person that knows my record in the legislature will know that I have been extremely broad in terms of how I view the state. Uh, a former colleague of mine that I disagreed on a number of items on, I agreed fully with him on one item. My ti current title, state senator, starts with state. I do represent the people in my district, but I operate in the best interests of all of the people in the state. And in my role as the joint chair, the, the co-chair of the Joint Ways and Means Committee, if you will look at my record, and where we have targeted dollars, you will see that it has been blind to where they are in the state, their geography. It has been to where the need is, where the need is for a courthouse, where the need is for the improvement in a regional university, where the need is for improvement in, in state police uh, patrol, where it is in almost every aspect, whether it's in human services, public safety, or education. And I think that's what you need to do. We are state representatives, two of us, and Commissioner Avakian is a statewide official, but we serve the entire state. And one of the best things that you can do in that regard is listen to people. And I've not quite traveled as much as Commissioner Avakian, but many people know I've traveled all over the state trying to examine issues before Ways and Means. Thank you. Representative Val Hoyle. Thank you. As the only candidate from outside the Portland metro area, I am very, very aware of the sensitivity that the rest of the state has to the Portland metro area getting all of the attention. And I do want to um, give great kudos to both of my colleagues who do spend time really reaching out and traveling around the state to listen to the voices there. Now my district in West Eugene and Junction City is a mix of an urban and rural district in Lane County. And so I, I grew up in the city. I'm not from a rural area, so I went out to Junction City and I talked to my local farmers. One of them said, I think it was the nicest compliment, he said, gosh, She's really been a strong advocate for us. She always shows up when we need her. But I've never voted for a Democrat. I'm not sure I can vote for her. But I do like her. She's great. <laughs> so the fact of the matter is you have to meet people where you are. Now, we don't always agree. You know, I, again, as House Majority Leader, passed a lot of progressive legislation, but really made a point to reach out and talk to my colleagues from other parts of the state and rural areas to say, how will this affect you? How can we do something that will actually help you, whether it's working on water issue, issues in Klamath or talking to people about timber issues out on the coast? Um, the fact of the matter is, 
You have to go out, you have to listen, and you have to find something that you can agree on. And that doesn't mean we have to have the same beliefs or the same party, but we have to meet people where they are, and I'm committed to doing that across this state just the same way I did that in my district. Our final question. With innovations like vote by mail and motor voter already enacted in Oregon, what do you see as the next advance in expanding and protecting voter rights in Oregon? This question goes first to Senator Richard Devlin. I was in the legislature when vote by mail came into, came into an existence. I supported it before I came in the legislature. I supported it when I was in the legislature, but most of you know it had to go to the initiative system to actually be approved. I also supported Motor Voter, and in my role as the vice chair of the Rules Committee in the House when I was in the minority, I opposed all attempts to limit access to the ballot, and there were many. And in my role as the chair of the Rules Committee in the Senate when I was a Democratic leader, I did everything possible to open up access, but I still believe there's more that needs to be done. Some things are small, some things are large. One of them is, you will notice the age of the people up here. Uh, uh, <laughs> Representative <Boyle. laughs> We all probably still buy stamps, but most of the public buy stamps very rarely. I actually believe it's time that we actually had return envelopes that were prepaid for voters. We send voters pamphlets to people, why don't we, uh, why don't we allow them easy access? And then I'm going to say something else that's controversial, but I don't think it's achievable in the 16th session. It's been before us before. There were perhaps good reasons for this when it was done, maybe not the best of reasons, but we have a 20-day waiting period for you to register. It is time we re-examined that and we shortened that period. Okay. We'll take, there's some problems with that in terms of difficulty in getting it accomplished, but there's really no justification for a 20-day waiting period. Thank you, Senator. All right, um, Representative Val Hoyle. Thank you. I, I think this is a great question. We've taken that first step. And with motor voter and automatic voter registration, we've added over 300,000 people to the voting rolls. But how do we get people to believe that their voice matters? How do we get people to, to think, well, if I vote, it will actually make a difference for me? Whether it's that person in a rural area, or it's a, it's a working mother, or it's someone in a community where they feel like they're not represented. And I think, again, the key thing, and, and Commissioner Avakian has, has spoken about it very well, is ensuring that we have civics. We have civics education and that we connect what we do in government to the people that we represent. So we used to spend a lot of time going out and registering people, and mostly in urban areas and college areas. Now with automatic, motor, automatic voter registration, we can spend more time going out and engaging voters. And we have to take the responsibility of engaging all voters. Now, there are things we can do, like making sure there are more ballot drop boxes, or as Senator Devlin said, you know, prepaid stamps so that it doesn't cost any, anything. We should remove all barriers to voting. At some point, when it is safe, we should look at how can we get internet voting put, put forward. But right now, we don't have that technology available, but we should be looking every day in every way to help people get connected, but more importantly, to let people feel like their government represents them. Thank you. Labor Commissioner Brad Avakian. Our democracy is only as strong as those who participate in it. And the way our elections work now with huge washes of money that flow into our state in order to affect our elections, it is very difficult for the individual Oregonian's voice uh, to, to fight. Uh, campaign finance limits are a necessity for us to have the kind of participatory democracy that we need. I'll advance that. The other is signature gathering enforcement, especially with out-of-state <laughs> firms that don't know our laws, that come to Oregon and try and create policy here. Uh, we need to make sure that, we are, uh, that they are not paying by the signature, that they're not fraudulently adding names uh, to, the, to, the ballot, to the signature sheets that they turn in. That kind of strong enforcement is important. And the other is, when you pick up your voter's pamphlet, 
and you read about a ballot measure and you see the ballot title and you read the description, we have got to make sure that that is an honest description of what you are really voting on. I am going to work very closely uh, with Oregon's Attorney General to make sure that ballot titles are accurate and that the information that voters have is exactly what they need in order to make the important decisions that affect our lives. Thank you. All right, it's now time for the two-minute closing statements. I'd remind the audience that we should uh, withhold all our applause till the end of the debate. The first closing statement goes to Senator Richard Devlin. We've talked a lot about what over the last hour. What the Secretary of State does, what we would do in that office, what we have respectively done in our public life. Before we go, I wanted to say a little bit about why. I was the second youngest of nine children in a f my family. To say that we struggled economically would be a kind way to put it. But there were two things that were instilled in me, especially by my, my mother. Education is the path from poverty. And whatever we, you do, wherever you go, you have an obligation to serve others. I have tried hard to live by those two principles as a parent, as a Marine, and as an elected official. When you grow up without money, when education and hard work opens every door, you do not forget it. Making sure Oregonians have the opportunity to learn, work, and give the kids, their kids a better future have been my highest priorities. And I have worked long and hard to make sure those opportunities are open to everyone who calls Oregon home, whoever they are, whoever they love, wherever they come from. I will also say something else, I believe, something that isn't popular to say. I believe in government. I don't believe government can do everything, but I believe it can do important things. I believe it in its power to do good. I believe in its power to spread opportunity. I believe in its ability to protect the incredible natural heritage we have as Oregonians. But to turn that belief into action and to give Oregonians confidence that it can be done means getting the details right. It means working to protect the integrity, openness, and inclusiveness of our election system. As I said at the opening, I may not be the most exciting speaker, but I am definitely the person who can do this job and do it right. And that matters for Oregon. Thank you for this time today. Representative Val Hoyle. I want to thank you for this conversation. You've got three strong candidates and a really, really tough choice to make. Um, as Majority Leader of the House, I've consistently been a voice for progressive values. Um, whether it was passing the most comprehensive paid sick leave law in the nation, expanding access to birth control and reproductive health care, or again, motor voter which was just incredible. And many people said, the opponents said, we don't need that. If someone wants to vote, they can. But I know that's not true. When I was a young mother, my, my children were both under five. My husband and I were working, working split shifts because that's how we could afford daycare. So I got a babysitter for an hour. I went down to the polling place. We're living in Wisconsin. We didn't have vote by mail. And uh, I waited 40 minutes to get to the polling, to, to get to vote. And I got there and the woman said, I'm sorry, you have to vote in the next polling place over because you're in the wrong precinct. I didn't have another hour. I didn't have another $5 for a babysitter for another hour and I had to put my children to bed. I was devastated. I had never missed an election. And I know these things happen. They happen to working mothers. They happen to veterans who are serving over, or people in the military serving overseas. They happen to students who are at school and away from home. They happen to homebound seniors. Now in Oregon, we do have vote by mail. So it's easier. It's certainly easier, but we can do more. Because Oregonians have a fundamental right to have their voice heard. So as your Secretary of State, what I'm committed to doing is making sure that every person has that chance and feels like their voice matters. That's why I'm running for Secretary of State, because I fundamentally want, believe that people should be excited about engaging in the process of electing people to serve in government. I also believe government 
um, can do great things, and I would be honored to serve you as your Secretary of State. Labor Commissioner Brad Avakian. A few weeks ago, I spent an evening on the picket line with the steel workers and their families in Albany. An out-of-state CEO that just got a $4 million raise locked them out of their jobs. Some of them have been loyal workers there for decades, and though those families are standing strong, they represent why our efforts on the right to form a union, fair wages, and eliminating income inequality are so important. Whether it was my years defending equality as a civil rights attorney, advocating for a higher minimum wage, fighting so-called free trade agreements, standing strong for choice and marriage equality, or making Oregon a leader in clean energy jobs, I've always been the kind of Democrat who puts our progressive values into action. And I have to tell you, it isn't enough just to have a D by your name. We need progressive Democrats that'll make sure that our values become reality. It means standing up for people when they need the help, even when it isn't the easy or the popular thing to do. As your labor commissioner, I've seen the families of the employees from Walmart who welcome a warm meal at a Ben's soup kitchen. I've looked in the eyes of a young African-American man who walks a mile through the back alleys to his plant because he's afraid of being met with a noose in the employee parking lot like his friend was. And I've known the children who want music in their lives but had their grade school bands and orchestras ripped out from under them because of inadequate school budgets. As your labor commissioner, I take these people to work with me every day. And I'll take them with me every day as your Secretary of State. Democrats, I want to thank you for hosting this uh, first uh, debate for the office and also Richard and Val for what I know is going to be a spirited campaign. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause now. Great candidates. Stay tuned. This is only the first debate.